we are living in a distracted age. We are living in a time that our attention uh, is decreasing and our ability to scroll without end, uh, to fill every moment of time with some sort, I think that that leaves our soul malnourished. And so if we're experiencing that or we're seeing that, I think the question is, so how do we break that? How do we find greater depth? How do we find a way of rediscovering uh, depth and significance in prayer? Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture podcast, in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. We long to see the body of Christ look like Jesus. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to ShiftingCulturePodcast.com to interact and donate. And don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app to be notified when new episodes come out each week. And go leave a rating and review. It's easy. It only takes a second, and it helps us find new listeners to the show. Just go to the show page on the app that you're using right now and hit five stars. Thank you so much. But even better than that, why don't you share this podcast with your friends? If you're enjoying it as much as I am, and I don't know if that's possible because I love doing this podcast, but if you are, I would highly recommend, please go share this with your friends and your family and say, hey, this is a great podcast for you to subscribe to, listen to. There's a lot of incredible things that are happening. So please, can you share this with other people? Previous guests on the show have included Adrian Reeves, Ryan Skoog, which is part one of Lead with Prayer, and Cameron Doolittle, which is part two of Lead with Prayer. You can go back, listen to those episodes and more. But today's guest is Peter Greer. Peter Greer is the president and CEO of Hope International, a global Christ-centered economic development organization serving throughout Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Eastern Europe. Under Peter's leadership, Hope has expanded from working in two to over 20 countries and served over 2.5 million families. Prior to joining Hope, Peter worked in Cambodia, Zimbabwe, and Rwanda. He has co-authored 15 books, including Mission Drift, Rooting for Rivals, The Gift of Disillusionment, and The Spiritual Danger of Doing Good. His new book, Lead with Prayer, is now available. Peter and I have a great conversation around the book, Lead with Prayer. We dive into the gift that prayer is. We talk through group discernment through listening and prayer, new postures that can aid our prayer life, carrying the culture of prayer so that we could help transform others. We marvel at the joy and hope that comes through suffering and the embodied presence of Jesus with us in the midst of that suffering. Join us as we discover new tools and ways to pray so that we can experience delight in ways that come through being with Jesus as we pray. Here's my conversation with Peter Greer. Well, Peter, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you on. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much for the invitation. Yeah, I'd love to to get into to prayer today. Um, so let's start a little bit with your uh, your prayer life. How did you, I know a lot of people, I don't know your journey with Jesus, but a lot of people e- either awaken to prayer right away um, with their journey to Jesus, or sometimes it's a different epiphany somewhere along the way, like, oh, I forgot that we need to to step into this. What's your journey with Jesus and prayer and your own prayer life? Yeah, I, w- I would say uh, I found odd comfort from the fact that when you look at uh, the vast majority of leaders and pastors, the vast majority would say that they are dissatisfied with their prayer life. And there's this gap between what we know to be true and then what we actually live as if it were true. And perhaps the gap is nowhere greater than when it comes to prayer, that we would say, what an incredible gift that we have to be able to commune with God Almighty in prayer. What an absolute amazing gift. And then the disconnect with that actually being woven in. And, you know, really for me, the moment when I first realized I had a prayer problem was when we were on a day of prayer and we were given this time and we were given the space and I just couldn't slow my mind down. I couldn't actually pray because my mind was just going so fast. And so really uh, this book, this process, uh, it has been an absolute gift to dive much deeper into the habits, the practices of prayer 
And uh, I believe it is possible to make progress. I believe it is possible to narrow that gap between what we say and what we do and to find not just the duty of prayer, but to discover a great delight in it. So I'd say that's the journey that I've been on and really working on the book with with Ryan and Cameron and Jill has just been an incredible gift uh, in my own life and understanding much greater depths and the beauty of of prayer. But so if you started to, like your mind wouldn't slow down in that time, what were some of the ways that you were able to start to slow your mind down so you could start to engage in prayer? Yeah. And so really the whole kind of writing process, we were trying to find leaders who pray, leaders that actually understand and practice prayer. And, you know, in some ways, uh, just emulating, just following their example has been the gift. And I find it really interesting that the disciples came to Jesus. And what was their question? They said, Lord, teach us how to pray exactly. And so I feel like that's the journey that we've been on. Uh, teach us how to pray. And, you know, some of the things that are so simple, uh, but have had an impact on my life is, first of all, just the exploration of posture, the way that physical posture is connected to our prayer life. And if our prayer posture is uh, lying down, head on the pillow, <laughs> with the lights out, that might not be the best place for deep, significant prayer. I'm not saying that's not the right time to pray. It certainly is. But if that's the extent, that's going to have an impact on our prayer life. And what we learn from individuals around the world is some real simple habits and practices that can align our body to shape our heart and to engage in more meaningful prayer. So that's one super practical uh, way that we just had to have fun experimenting um, and uh, looking at the connection between our physical posture and our prayer life and found uh, much greater depth and attention uh, as a result. It is interesting that we don't really think about physical posture very much. You know, as somebody who, who trains missionaries, I was a missionary myself around the world. One of the, the big things of brand new believers is teach us how to pray. And I find a lot of missionaries just say, oh, you just talk to God. It's easy. But Jesus didn't do that with the Lord's Prayer, right? He said, here's a recited prayer that you could pray. You could go through these steps, and it's really helpful for people. What's a what's one posture that has helped you or a posture that you found while interviewing some of these leaders with prayer that they have done that you go, oh, I want to start to engage in, in that posture because I think it's really helpful? Yeah, I mean, so just the one that comes to mind that we heard in Whenever we heard themes from different individuals from around the world, uh, our ears perked up when there were different uh, practices. Um, And so uh, just real, real simple. The two uh, that I found most helpful, uh, one was uh, Justin Wilbur Early uh, talked about how uh, every day he just got in the habit. First thing, before even the eyes are fully open, uh, getting down on his knees and starting the day there and then ending the day in the same way. And uh, that that does something to the heart. And I uh, found the same thing uh, to be true with our friends um, in the Philippines that we had the privilege of, of learning with. But similarly, they would have their body um, and they'd have these prayer mats. And that was how they started. So that was one just real simple, real practical. But throughout the history, followers of Jesus have had this posture of saying, we want to make sure that we are yeah, there's a level of humility. There's a level of of, of attentiveness uh, that happens with that. So that's one simple one. And then the other one is just the exploration of even simple hand postures. Uh, we found several individuals that would start with just palms up, hands open, and uh, saying, Lord, here I am. Uh, fill me, use me. And then ending the prayer with turning the hands over and saying, the things that I'm carrying, the burdens that I have, I release them to you um, as a way of framing uh, the prayers. Um, and again, just small examples, but uh, it was fun to experiment and to understand this connection. Uh, our posture, uh, it does impact uh, our prayer life. I was meeting with my spiritual director earlier today, and I have, I think last night, went into a place of, of frenzy and chaos, and I needed peace and be grounded with the peace of Jesus, and I couldn't find it. I I wasn't doing very well last night. So I was asking, how do I become grounded? And one of the ways, you know, he just asked me, okay, I'm just ask the Lord, where is, where do you find peace in your body? And the first thing that came to my mind 
was that I needed to be on my knees. Like yeah. peace comes on my knees. And it felt like that posture of like kneeling before the Lord is the thing that's going to bring peace to the situation that I find myself in or any situation that I need to to get there, to get to that posture. And so bringing mm-hmm. that up, that posture of, of being on our knees is really, I think, important, you know, even individually for me to, to dive into and say, okay, God, here's my posture. Now start to, to do this. And then that open hand posture and then releasing things back to the Lord. Uh, my question for you, like as you interact and work throughout the world, and I know that, you know, with Hope International, there's probably a lot of crises and, and difficult things on the ground everywhere. And you're going to have to do the, that posture, like receive from the Lord and then release it to him. Is there a, a specific moment that you could think of uh, as you're, you're leading in a different crisis moment where you're, you're practically or just like, this is the, the posture that I'm receiving from him, that I'm releasing it. And what effect did that have? Mm. Yeah. And thanks so much for sharing your personal experience even recently with last night and today thank you yeah i i resonate with that a lot yeah and over the last couple of years uh it certainly seems like there have been more opportunities than ever before <laughs> to feel uh overwhelmed and uh isn't that a great invitation into prayer uh but some of the specific moments uh, for us uh we were founded as an organization uh, partnering with a church in Zaporozhye, Ukraine. And uh, Zaporozhye, um, where Hope International was founded, made the headlines uh, because that is not far away from where a lot of the uh, fighting with Russia's invasion into Ukraine. And, and there was uh, we saw on the news about the power plant uh, that was there and the fighting that was all around there. And that is not just a city. That's where our friends are. That's where our colleagues are. That's where the families are that we serve are and yeah that 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 was a moment where you literally like you can't control the situation you do everything you do to care for the staff to figure out how we're going to care for the families that we serve and 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 even now to figure out how do we rebuild and invest in entrepreneurs in Ukraine and, and help them rebuild their nation but there is so much that feels completely out of control and isn't it an amazing gift uh, to have in those moments of feeling overwhelmed, feeling like it is beyond you to know what to do um, and to go to the one who is wise enough, who who is full of so much uh, love and so much grace and is active in those places. And just simply to say, um, you know, we found the power of uh, some short prayers over the last uh, couple of years, but huh, Lord help, Lord save Lord deliver, Lord rescue, and um, just uh, praying for our friends and our colleagues, and uh, finding again that odd sense of sometimes the situation doesn't immediately change, uh, but you can have a little bit more of a release uh, when you remember who it is that you're speaking to. I think it's really hard when you're at a place where you're leading something and you're trying to give gravity and leadership to a situation where you don't have control. That's a really hard place to be as a leader. Um, and one of the things that I, I worry about when we talk about, you know, different postures of leadership or how, how to lead is that, especially, you know, in this book, the worry that I have is that prayer is going to be another leadership hack. We're going to, sure. you know, just utilize this so that we can be successful in our own right, that we could lift up our own selves and go, I'm just going to use prayer for my own organization or my own leadership, how can we avoid that temptation of just trying to make it a new hack for us and just be in the presence of the Lord and do it for prayer's sake and then fruit comes because of that? That is so good. I so appreciate you doing that. And yeah, if this is a tool, a trick, a technique, a hack uh, that ultimately look at how it benefits me, uh, we have lost the very beginning point of remembering who we're speaking to. 
um, remembering whose presence we are entering into in this incredible mystery of prayer. And I love how in the book of Jeremiah, there's this phrase, uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, and, and it really answers that question uh, so clearly. But it, but it has this line where it says, um, it, it actually says it in really strong words. It says, cursed are those who rely on human strength, uh, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. And it's possible in leadership, even in our prayer, to have it be very self-serving, very self-seeking. This is what I want. This is what I need. This is the way I can manipulate uh, these circumstances for my own good and to try and engineer our success and use the tool or trick of prayer in the process. But then Jeremiah 17 goes on it, but blessed are those whose hope in the Lord and made the Lord their hope and confidence. And I think that's really what this comes down to at the, at the very beginning, at the very end is this invitation to remember who it is that we are speaking with, to come to the end of our limits, the end of our ability, and to truly want God's will more than our own. And uh, again, I find that just opens up the heart, opens up the hands, um, and it's less about what I want um, and much more about uh, God. Um, oh, we need you. You know, it's so interesting. One of the interviews uh, was with Johnny Erickson Donna and that was a incredible uh, privilege to have time to learn from her. But but she said a lot of people over the years have come to her and asked for very specific prayers for healing. Um, and, you know, she says, my prayers for healing or relief from this incredible pain, I'm still praying that. Uh, it has not come. But she said, I will pray for that. But I'm going to spend at least 80% of the prayer time praying not just for the issue but that God might be at work in the midst of it. Um, and I thought that to be such an interesting perspective to say, yeah, of course we're going to pray for the things that are on our hearts, but are we also going to pray with a higher degree of trust, a greater degree of confidence that even in incredible difficulty, God is still at work. And uh, that conversation with her, I, that, that's one of the ones that just has been resonating, even about the way that we pray and what we pray for. And it has far less to do with specific answers to what I want and much more. God, you're at work. Your ways are best. Show me, lead me, teach me, and help me to have the courage to obey. I think we often think that, you know, prayer is talking to God, um, but we often forget about the listening part. And I think that what she's talking about in the midst of of real difficult circumstances that are probably not going to change we're walking with them, but the presence of God with us is is so important. And knowing that he's there, either through hearing his voice or just feeling his presence, how then in those difficult times do we get to a place where we're not just petitioning God and saying, help, 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 do this, but okay, what do you want in this situation, Lord? What are you saying in this situation? Or how can I hear you? Please, you know, speak in this way, be present here. How could we move our posture from petition to listening and being with God in prayer? Isn't it interesting that when the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray, uh, he gave some specific words. Um, and those words are incredibly powerful. And what is one of the ones in there? Your will be done. Um, and, and I think that's a huge piece of this is aligning, not just our desires, uh, but to have them shaped, to have them formed uh, by a desire to see, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And for that to be what drives us, for that to be the vision that we are going after, for that to be the primary prayer. Can you give me an example of you going into a new country with, with hope and saying, God, what is your will in this country? We want your will to be done here. And that what are some of the the things that opened up because you are willing to say, God, we want your kingdom to be here, to be unveiled to to these people. How do you want to go about doing that? Yeah, and I'm so thankful for uh, Ruth Haley Barton. She wrote a book called Pursuing God's Will Together. And in that book, she gives a great blueprint for how to do this. And in many ways, uh, there's some similarity between that of what is not just the individual, but what is the corporate discernment process? And I think about uh, the recent country that we uh, launched into uh, is in West Africa, it's Benin, 
And this is a place, it's a region that we had not been in before. And up until the moment that we presented to the board of directors, there were several countries that we thought were great options. And to go through that discernment process, to go through that, and yes, you want to gather the facts. Yes, you want to do the research. You want to look for where are those invitations. And uh, then at the end, before the decision is made, is there time? Is there space to not do a little prayer pixie dust uh, that you sprinkle on the top, but to actually engage in the listening process? And I'm so thankful our board chair um, uh, puts this into practice. And just before the decisions are made, uh, without fail, pause. Uh, Let's stop. Let's listen um, uh, before uh, yeah, any decision is made. The nice thing that you guys did is you interviewed people from all over the world, global leaders, and saying, here, teach us uh, how to pray. What does it look like? I often think because, you know, in the West, you know, I'm sitting here in Kansas City, you're sitting in the West as well. What is it? We think things through individually. It's an individualistic culture that we live in. We think that it's our personal prayer time. But that corporate discernment process is not just individual. What does it look like then to hold hands together in prayer? Like, how do we we do that with one another? And it's not just, you know, our own individual prayer time. Yeah, it's really interesting. If you type into Google uh, about prayer, what are the images that come up? It is all individual, like almost all. The very way that we think about prayer is a individual activity. And yet that is not necessarily the way that it is thought about, seen or experienced um, corporately. And in some ways in our culture, it can feel a little bit awkward. I don't know who's going to speak. And I, I'm more of an introvert. I don't know if I really want to share. And I think in those settings, there's two two maybe recommendations. One is start small. Maybe instead of finding a whole room full of people, maybe it's just one or two people. But it is it is powerful when you pray with and in agreement with another person. And then maybe if it's a little bit of a larger setting, uh, you know, we've really enjoyed using every moment holy. And that gives language uh, around prayers and different events and different prompts. And maybe it's more using some of the prayers of someone else uh, to guide. And then you're praying in agreement with uh, words that have been uh, written and prayed uh, by others. Uh, So there's just, I guess that to me is like one of the biggest takeaways. There's so much more to explore, regardless of where you are in your prayer journey. There's there's so much more depth. (laughs) There's so much more to explore. And um, yeah, again, that's been the great joy is let's learn from others. Let's learn from praying leaders. Let's learn from other practices that might be outside of, you know, just what I am comfortable with and an experiment. And my experience, our experience uh, was that you might discover some new depth um, in, in your enjoyment and experience of this incredible gift of prayer. Mm. What do you think? <laughs> I, I've heard I had I was talking to somebody that has written that. A number of books and he said my my least successful books are the ones about prayer <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to hear that when we're about to release a book on prayer <laughs> well but i but it's the foundation is like one of the most important things right. but i so i'm not talking about the success of your book or not like <laughs> we're we're it's we're gonna get people to be able to pray but i think a lot of people think that prayer I don't know isn't very important I I just I mean as anecdotally like talking about you know I'm not going to buy a book on prayer why uh, it just means talking to God why do you think it's important for us to to dive deep into this to say grow in our depth of our enjoyment and our love of prayer of being with the one who created us which is what it is like, wow, I get to be in the presence of God, which is the coolest thing ever is awesome. But why do you think that I hopefully things are changing in this in this world? I mean, we're going through a lot of crazy times. So hopefully we're going to get back into a place of, hey, I need to rely on God. But why do you think that we we really need to to dig into this now? Why is it so important? Yeah, and I would say uh, to those people that when they think about their prayer life, They are fully satisfied. 
They are fully enjoying it. They don't need the book on that. But for the others, <laughs> then at least statistically, <laughs> is a significant portion uh, that say, oh, I want to grow in this area. I I resonate. Every time I read those words of the disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. Like that, that resonates uh, with me so much. For those individuals, I think we have a lot to learn from the global church. I think we have a lot to look from the historical church. And I think we have a lot to learn from leaders that have figured out how to build cultures of prayer. Um, so I would say that's it. The question of why now, I think the other component that we are seeing is we are living in a distracted age. We are living in a time that our attention uh, is decreasing and our ability to scroll without end, uh, to fill every moment of time with some sort, I think that that leaves our soul malnourished. And so if we're experiencing that or we're seeing that, I think the question is, so how do we break that? How do we find greater depth? How do we find a way of rediscovering uh, depth and significance in prayer. And again, part of the deal is I don't think that is always experienced alone in one minute distracted prayers. I think there's there's a benefit um, in slowing down our minds, slowing down our hearts, and maybe some of the, you know, one of the chapters on the ability to retreat. Isn't it amazing that Jesus with limited time to do all that he kept disappearing? He kept pulling away. And if that is true for Jesus, maybe it's true for us. And if we have never pulled away to have devoted, focused, undistracted time, we can't remember the last time that we had a moment like that. Wouldn't it be great to experiment? Wouldn't it be great to try it out? And so I think that's part of the issue now is um, I just, I just, in my own life, distracted, like internal RPMs too high, it was having an impact on my soul and uh, slowing down. And uh, again, I think prayer is this unbelievable gift uh, with so much more depth to explore. Um, and my guess is it might uh, have a really transformational impact um, on you and on the relationships and on the way that you lead. Mm -hmm. I think so too. And I think one of the things that I, I believe is that if we want to grow a culture or grow a culture of prayer in the places where we lead, it often comes through a person that is carrying that presence of whatever culture that you want to impart. You're imparting culture to other people. I don't think that, hey, we have a value of prayer, just writing it down without carrying it and living it out ourselves. It's not going to transform the rest of the organization that we're leading. So what are some of the rhythms that we can engage in to start then to transform the entire culture to grow in rhythms of prayer and to create a culture of prayer? Yeah. So one of the people that we interviewed uh, for the book, his name is David, and and he was doing a lot to study prayer and to try and find a way of of learning about prayer. And uh, he had this firm conviction. You got a model before you multiply. And that changed everything. It was him learning to practice in a way and, and then to multiply. And in a similar way, that's what we saw. That's what we experienced is the leaders that have created cultures of prayer. They're not afraid to go first, to say, let me change the way that I pray. Let's let's understand what that looks like. And then in a very authentic way to invite others into that journey of that. And so all kinds of great examples of what that looks like in the nonprofit and the for-profit, all kinds of great examples. Uh, but I remember visiting the International Justice Mission and finding it eerily quiet um, every day at 830 <laughs> Uh, because that's when they shut everything down to pray. And uh, Gary Haugen, uh, founder, said, uh, essentially, how could we think that we'll be able to do this global work combating human trafficking if we do not uh, find time to stop and pray? This mission is beyond our ability. And in a similar way with Hope International, there's something beautiful and powerful we don't do it at 8.30, we do it at 11.30, but like literally just stopping, ceasing, 
and gathering uh, to pray together for what's going on around the world, for what's going on in our lives, um, and to just be reminded that this mission that we're going after, uh, it is impossible without God's uh, incredible grace and divine intervention. I want to dive even a little bit deeper of like modeling and then multiplying out. So we're we're modeling, and now you're getting the, the some staff to be able to do it. We're going to pause. We're going to do that. This is our rhythm, a daily rhythm that we're going to stop at 1130, and we're going to do that. So if you're whatever, maybe Benin or whatever country that you're in, and you have the disciples that you're working with or people. So how then does it multiply out to the people that are utilizing the savings bank that you're you're doing that are helping to getting microfinancing loans and starting their own businesses and coming out of poverty? Is there a way that that starts to multiply out even to the disciples, the people that are utilizing and your services and the people that you engage with and work with? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I see it almost as this uh, circle where it is, you know, when I spend time uh, with families around the world and you get to pray with them and it's not just one way. I mean, of course, we want to be praying for our team and for the families that we serve, but then to also have them pray for you. Oh, it is so humbling and and powerful on that. And 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 there is such a beautiful like we're coming together uh, in front of God Almighty um, as brothers and sisters linking arm in arm. Uh, there is no other dynamic uh, other than coming together. And yeah, so I, I think about that. But in the places that we serve uh, around the world, operationally, the way that it works is we go through these five W's every time a group gathers. So we're trying to, um, you know. The core mission is about investing in the dreams of families as we proclaim and live the gospel. So we are investing in entrepreneurs. We're helping them start or expand small businesses, and we're helping them grow closer to Christ as they go about this work. And um, so when the groups gather and, you know, we have now served 2.7 million families that have been either receiving a savings uh, account or been able to invest together or receive a loan. And uh, every time they gather together, they go through five W's. So five W's are welcome, worship, word, work, and wrap up. And there's something amazing that if you look at that, uh, one of them is about the financial transaction and saving and investing. That's the work portion. But the other portions are about this experience together and the welcome and the worship. This is a time in our words, in our prayers, and in our song. We start every gathering inviting God's presence in. Um, because we serve a God of hope um, and in the communities we serve in, which is real. I mean, it's extreme poverty. I can't imagine trying to do this work without that hope uh, that is rooted in the gospel. Uh, so that's how we start. We start with prayer and we start with worship and we start with checking in. How are we doing? Um, and the opportunity to really yeah, have prayer as a foundational component uh, of, of this, uh, this work. Um, so it's not just about investing in dreams from the financial capital. It's so much more than that. The relationships and prayer plays a significant role in that as well. Hmm. That's really good. And I think that's really helpful that we're investing in a holistic model of life, that there's, you know, the financial gain and the, the finances and out of poverty, but we're also, there's poverty of uh, our spiritual lives of, as well that we want to invest in. And I'm sure there's there's poverty of our, you know, their familiar lives and our community lives that we're trying to, you're trying to build people together and grow together. So there's all sorts of growing up into that. And I think prayer is essential in that leading of it and multiplying it out. Um, that was a great example. Well done. That's all thanks. Awesome. <laughs> That's good. Uh, as you, you went through this book and started to to talk through leaders, for you, what really resonated? Like, is there a chapter in there that's like, oh, that's my, that's that's Peter's chapter. This is this is the <laughs> thing that I I really gravitated towards, or the leader that I spoke to that I was like, oh, I can't stop thinking about that. That's that's so good. Yeah. Oh, there are so many in that. I already referenced it briefly, but. I don't know if I captured it in the way that I was just talking, but 
there was a joy in Johnny Erickson Tata. Like there, there, there was a joy and there was a depth and her suffering and scripture shaped her prayer life in a way that I can't stop thinking about it. I, I, I just can't. There, there is so much more. I went back and I read some other uh, of her books and I read them with a new voice in my ears and a new perspective uh, in that. So that's the one that stands out. I think the other one, you know, there was several uh, leaders from around the world that are just living in unimaginably complex uh, situations. And and there was a joy that defied circumstance in several of them. And the line that just stood out uh, several times was essentially getting your, getting your heart happy in the Lord and actually finding your soul satisfaction, finding your contentment, finding your peace in your relationship with the one who made you, the one who knows you, the one who saves you. And then how that just changes how you go about the day. Uh, That changes the way you experience disappointment because you've already experienced the delight of, of your heavenly father. And I don't know that, that idea of finding prayer, not as drudgery, but delight. And I'm, I'm not there yet, but I have had moments while we've been working on this book and trying some things that, that I think for the first time in my life, I experienced delight in prayer. And that was, that was new. I want more of that. I often am surprised that the most joyful people are the ones that have suffered. And why do you think that is? Mm. Uh, that is beyond my pay grade uh, on that one. <laughs> I, 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 the only thing that comes to mind is when you have the distractions peeled away and when you actually get to experience grace and peace that defies circumstance, uh, I think there is a different level of depth and experience that you have uh, in that moment. So I think suffering, perhaps unlike anything else, causes us to say we can't save ourselves. We can't. We can't fix what is broken. But there's one who delights in being present in that moment. And I think that's what they've experienced. They've experienced the letting go of the illusions of the shadows and holding on to that, which is real and true life. Yeah. The presence of Jesus in our lives, of just being with us in the midst of everything and knowing that he is faithful to be with us. I think it's such a, man, it's such a crucial piece and moment that I can't do anything apart from the Lord now. I think that's part of it. It's like I can't do anything else except for be with Jesus, Jesus with me. And so that's, I mean, that's huge. I mean, we have, you know, unimaginable suffering. You know, the founders of my, the missions organization that I helped run all nations, the founder, you know, Floyd McClung was, you know, in the hospital for five years before he passed away, like, trapped in his body, his wife, Sally, gone through cancer for many years. But Sally, going through that with her husband, going through cancer treatment after cancer treatment and surviving, but can't really get in out of her house. She has probably the biggest joy that I have ever seen. Um, because And it comes through in her communication and her writing, and she just delights in being with the Lord. Um, it's it's tremendous to be able to see people and to say, okay, I want some of that, but I don't know if I want that suffering peace, but I want some of that joy. Yeah. Um, but we have a, a suffering servant. We have Jesus who suffered for us. So suffering is such a key to our life with Christ that we don't often want to engage in, but we do get <laughs> the, the presence of Jesus when we do suffer. If you could tell the the listener here or your reader one thing, what would you want them to get out of this? What would you want them to step away from? And how would their life be transformed because of this? Yeah, I guess maybe it's just that simple idea of it is possible to make progress, like real meaningful progress in your prayer life. And I, so I would just say, like, try it. Try it for a month try some new habits, try some new practices. And we tried to create as many tools as we could, because this is not just about a book. 
we are thrilled to imagine what might happen if there was a movement in our day, in our time, of people that rediscovered this incredible, incredible gift of prayer. So I'd say try it. Uh, Try it for a month. And um, if you need some help, uh, there's a real simple 21-day kind of prayer uh, guide that we have to help people start on this journey. Um, And I would just say try and experiment with it. And uh, you might just, um, yeah, be surprised at how much it impacts you. I think it's really helpful. Like every chapter, you got you got practical ways to pray and to engage, and practical steps. And I'm so thankful for that because oftentimes you get a a prayer book, you get something, and it's very inspiring. And then you're like, oh, I can't enter into that. I can't do that. That's not me. But you have these these steps that you say, enter into this practice and see how it fits and see how it could work for you. And then you, you keep going through those those chapters and you've created a lot more. So leadwithprayer.com, you have a lot more resources on there to be, for people to enter into. And I think that's really going to benefit uh, a tremendous amount of people. And I know that prayer resources have been incredibly helpful for millions of people around the world. And I just pray that this also is one of those resources that many people benefit from, step into, start to pray, because when we pray and God leads, we hear from him, we do what he says, sure. incredible things are going to happen. We're going to see transformation happen all over the world. Before I get into two last questions that i like to ask, I'd love to ask for you, what is exciting with something in Hope International, what are you really excited about right now of what Hope is doing around the world? Yeah, you know, the thing that comes immediately to mind is, so we've been around for 26, 27 years as an organization and really had this area of focus. We're going to do a small number of things and we're going to try to do it really well. And those two things are uh, church-centered savings groups and then uh, microfinance institutions. Um And as we've been doing that, we've had a number of other organizations that have reached out and said, we want to figure out how we can include some sort of economic development component. And our response in the past was just to say, "Uh, here's our, uh, what we've developed, go for it. We're cheering for you. (laughs) And uh, a few years ago, uh, we started a little bit different of saying, well, what if we could actually do more with that? What if we could actually have a part of hope to train and equip other organizations still with this posture of open handedness? And so we call it Savings Group Multiply. And uh, we've been training and partnering with other organizations. And it has been awesome to see the uh, kind of scale and impact in a short amount of time. And really just these friendships grow with other organizations that were doing important missions work or church planning. But now to have another tool uh, that they can use uh, to address extreme poverty. So that's been fun. Just the partnership, the open handedness. And uh, just this reminder, um, yeah, we are part of a bigger mission that extends beyond the bounds of any one organization. And if we can leverage, if we can take what we've learned and the models, train and equip other organizations, that's just going to be much more kingdom impact um, as a Mm. result. Yeah. And it's going to have a lot. I'm just going to just anecdotally in our organization, we have a, a piece we call Pioneer Business Planting, where we're helping people plant businesses and churches among unreached people groups. And that has really the most fruitful thing that we're doing right now around the world is through that. And so bringing both of those things together has been crucial. So I would highly recommend people check that out uh, so that they you could train them, help them in a way. I think it's extremely beneficial and fruitful as you're bringing a holistic view of what it looks like to bring up a community uh, together in a way that looks like the kingdom. It's amazing. So Peter, if you could go back to your 21 year old self, what advice would you give? Well, I would just say, uh, don't forget that in all of the work, all of the striving, uh, don't forget, uh, prayer as a critical component of all of it, uh, be centered, be rooted, um, in prayer, which I didn't have to wait, uh, till this point. Uh, discover some of the beauty um, of that. So I mean, mm. that obviously is top of mind based on what we've just been talking about. Yeah. But uh, I, I sincerely mean that. I think that would have made a difference. I know that would have made a difference in the way that I lead and serve. And and um, yeah. 
Awesome. Anything you've been reading or watching lately you could recommend? I I have been, this is so random, but uh, it's the first thing that came to mind. I got to meet uh, someone named Creek Stewart, <laughs> and he is a survivalist. And I have had so much fun checking out his videos online. And I think part of the fascination with that is with a survivalist, this is someone who is getting out into nature with a very small number of things. And I think that in this world that we live in that is so tech addicted, uh, the ability to let go, enjoy this world, maybe connects to our conversation here. Yeah. But I have just been so interested in getting into nature experiencing things that you don't see if you are looking at a screen and and so that's what we've had fun with as a family watching mm -hmm. videos of creek stewart and uh <laughs> survival skills that if i happen to be dropped off in a remote island uh i i'd be able to survive a little bit longer as a result <laughs> of what we've been experiencing <laughs> with it that's the first thing that came to mind that's awesome creek stewart all right i, I gotta check him out check out his videos that should be a lot of fun how can people connect with you? Uh, where would you like to point people to? How can people go out and get your book? Yeah, so hopeinternational.org for anything related to what we were just talking about related to the savings group and, and global missions uh, on that side. And then uh, with the book, if you go with leadwithprayer.com, that's the best way to go. And again, all of the prayer tools uh, are available there as well. So leadwithprayer.com and personally, you go to Peter K. Greer. Um, that's where I am on all the socials, uh, but PeterKGreer.com. You want to connect with me. And if I can help in any way, I would love to try and do it. Awesome. Peter, thank you so much for this conversation to really dive deep in what it looks like to lead with prayer, that we could have joy in suffering, that we could experience the presence of Jesus in our lives, that we could go and have helpful postures like being on our knees or opening our hands, releasing things to the Lord that through crisis and difficulty that we could pray, that we could grow up and and have a prayer culture that we can model and then multiply it out, not just with our staff, but also with the people that we work with all around the world uh, through what we're doing. So thank you for this conversation. I think it was enlightening and helpful. There's practicals in it. Uh, so it was well done. I really enjoyed it. So thank you. Oh, I thoroughly enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you're really enjoying the show, please don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app. You could do it right now. Just hit that little plus. Um, and then I would love it if you would leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. So you could go right now to the show and leave a star rating uh, and review and let us know how you are enjoying the show. And find us on Facebook and Instagram. So if you want to connect, interact, uh, I post a lot of quotes and different things that you could actually interact with the episodes and let me know how you are enjoying the show. If you feel inclined to donate, uh, there is a support the show link in the show notes, um, and it would send you directly to a page where you could donate so that new episodes can be produced for your enjoyment. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and I hope you have an incredible week. <music>